There's this myth that the rugged individualist should be the idol of our age. That a pair of bootstraps and self-determination are all a person needs. But there's another way to view the world. As John Donne said, no man is an island, and I believe we're meant to be connected. This series is my attempt to showcase the people I know and love who are building communities with creativity and passion. People from around the country who are working on building a stronger bond between people. I want to show that we don't arrive at the beloved community through grand actions or sweeping legislation, but through the daily commitment to positive action by the people around us. Nostalgia can be cyanide, slow-acting poison that starts by attacking our eyesight, darkening our vision. Then it moves to our mouths where our speech is slurred into the cliché phrases, good old days, when I was younger, not how things used to be. Finally, it settles on our brain, and we believe that today is nothing like what used to be. We resign ourselves to a degraded society and choose to muddle through, all the while pining for a yesterday that never was. But Ed Mulvihill has control nostalgia, using it as a catalyst to build a bridge between his past and his future. Ed was James's best friend growing up, one of the few kids to understand that the popular items of the day were fleeting. Since he was young, Ed's favorite movie has been It's a Wonderful Life. In George Bailey, he saw a bit of himself, a small-town kid who realizes the importance of that community and learns of the power and responsibility he has as a member of that community. Ed has lived in Belfont all of his life, only a few blocks from the small Catholic school we attended as kids. Across the street from St. Helena stands Pico's, the liquor store his great-grandfather built. That store has been in Ed's family for more than 70 years. Outside, you can look down Philadelphia Pike to the city of Wilmington, home of Silesianum. Ed knew he'd walk its halls in high school like so many of his male relatives. In the other direction is St. Joseph's in Philly, where Ed got his college degree. But it's always been his plan to come back to Pico's. He loves that store, and all it means is a family institution. On its racks and in its corners are his relatives, and the years of work that they put in to make it a successful business. Ed doesn't work for a museum, though. He's constantly looking for new ways to satisfy customers. Whether it's using social media to teach people how to make special drinks, or working with local elected officials to pass legislation, Ed is building on the history of Pico's while making some himself. My family's been in the area for a long time, like over 100 years, uh, which is pretty cool. And Belfont's this unique area because it's a small community, uh, a lot of independent businesses, which is kind of rare these days, obviously. Um, but I've always really liked Belfont and Penny Hill and, and all that. And, you know, never really could see myself really going anywhere else. You know, I always thought, like, well, this is, this is home. Um, so... For me, being involved with the family business that's been in our neighborhood, like literally, I mean, my house is, my house I bought is five blocks away, my parents' house is three blocks away, and my grandparents' house is, you know, a block away. So yeah. we're all in this little area, which is nice, but um, I always wanted to be close for the store. I mean, when you own a business, you're kind of like always on call, um, which isn't a bad thing, you know, but you need to be close in case, you know, God knows what happens. But uh, So I never could see myself leaving, and that's, that's why I'm still here. I mean, it all kind of ties in. It's, it's the same type of thing. What, what, we have 12, 12, 12 kids in our grade school class, you know, which was abnormally small. But when you talk about a large-sized Catholic grade school class was like 25 kids, maybe 40 if you're lucky, you know. So um, that was important, you know, just because you realize, like, how simple things can be, you know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a big school or a big class. But, I mean, I think for me, I just always felt more comfortable in a smaller setting, Um at Sally's, it was the same thing. So Sally's is a very, you know, big 
Catholic high school, but there's still only 250 kids in our class. I think my fiance's high school class had over 500 kids, you know. So, I don't know. I just feel more comfortable with that. Um, maybe it's because it's easier for you to identify with other people. You know, there's less people to get to know, so you find those people that you identify with quicker. I don't know. Uh, but even St. Joe's, when I went there, that's in Philly, which is, you know, a big city. But St. Joe's itself is a very small um, mm-hmm. school. I just, I don't know. I always, I always like that. That was always my comfort zone. Um, I, I just thought that I don't like, you know, big schools. I mean, my brother goes to UD. I always had a lot of fun going down there to see him. But I don't know. Just for me, it was a comfort thing. I think friends are, like, the most important thing that you can have. I don't think that there's anything that can really replace that. Um, and so it's always been important for me to stay in touch with people who I, you know, consider close friends or even just acquaintances. And it's, it's you know, it's important. And it's one of the hardest things is losing touch with people, you know, that you really don't want to lose touch with. But, you know, sometimes it's inevitable. Sometimes, you know, people change, situations change. You know, you can't control it all. But, um, yeah, I just I think that's important. And I think that there's so much of myself that comes from those people that I was with, you know, at various stages of my life. They have all contributed to who I am, and so you want to hold on to that, you know, and have them be part of your life forever, hopefully. I, I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, maybe it's because I grew up here, but, like, for me, I've just never been attracted to, like, those big cities or, well, not, not even that. I mean, I like New York. I love going to New York. When Jackie was at school in New York, it was a great time. But, I mean, as far as a where I want to live and where I want to have my family and all that. It was always just here. And it doesn't have to, I don't know if it has to be this area in particular, but it has that community feeling, you know, that, that you can't find everywhere else. I mean, I like being able to walk down the street and see everyone I know, you know, and like be like, oh, there's, you know, so-and-so and go to the supermarket and see 18 people, you, you know, or whatever. And that's, I mean, I think that's special. I think it's nice. I think it creates a sense of like, everybody's looking out for you. You know, it doesn't always work to your advantage. Like when I was a kid, I remember like the first time I ever cussed, I mean, I think my mom knew it before the words left my mouth because, you know, so-and-so called so-and-so who called my mom and said, hey, your boy's cursing up the street. And, you know, by the time I got home, it was like, that was the end of that. <laughs> uh, but I lo- I just always like that, you know, and I think some people feel differently. I think some people feel trapped by that or feel, you know, like, oh, my God, like, it's the same people do the same thing. I'm just a plain dude. I'm very simple, and I like things simple, and that's, you know... I think that is one of the big differences between being an old Georgie boy is like, yeah, George definitely had that, like, I want to get out of here and do something else. And I, yeah, I, I like it here. I, I just want to make this better, you know. Um, Belfont's a great community. It's always been a great community. Uh, and we're actually working on a project now that's trying to revitalize this whole Penny Hill and Belfont area to bring in some new businesses, restaurants and dining and, you know, shopping and stuff, which would just enhance it. Um, this area is really in demand. It's always been in demand. We get new customers all the time and they always say, oh, we just we just moved into the neighborhood, we just did this, we just did that. Right now it's really trending to a younger, like that 20 something, 30 something crowd, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's all good. And, and people know that this is a unique area and you have the shops down the, the street. But the biggest thing is that, that fact that there's, the, aside from like the gas station and the Wawa, there's no big chains, you know? I mean, these are very, these are businesses that were all established that have been around for a long time. You can walk in and see the owner working, you know, I mean, that's, that's just not how the world works anymore. So part of it is, wow, look at this, you've got, it's almost like a time capsule, you know. How often do you go somewhere and see an independent, you know, business? That's one thing about New York that when I would go up to see Jackie, I always liked to see all these unique businesses. Uh, we really like Anthony Bourdain, is like one of our favorite shows to watch, and he did this thing on Disappearing Manhattan, it was called. And it was a special where he went to all these well-established, independently owned New York eateries and, and, and also butcher shops, you know, fishmongers, steak steakhouses, French cuisine, all restaurants that have been there forever. And it was the whole point was like, well, these are disappearing. And so we made a bucket list of like before she was done living in the city and going to school, we were gonna go visit each of these places. We only didn't, we didn't go to one of them because it was like $150 per entree, so we didn't go. <laughs> but I mean, went to one place, it was just like a little Italian uh, deli and they made sandwiches. It was delicious. And yeah, the owners were there. And she was really nice. She came and talked to us at the table. She said, are you looking for a place? Because we have an open apartment, you know, which is rare in, in Hell's Kitchen. So, I mean, it was really neat. And then, you know, two seconds later, we're walking down some, you know, who knows what street in New York City. And you see a Cozy, a McDonald's, a Burger King, a Wendy's, a Taco Bell, you know, a Borders Books, a Barnes & Noble. I mean, they're all chains, you know. They have no identity. So, to me, what's so unique about going to New York, the greatest city in the world, if you're going to shop at a Borders and a... McDonald's, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And then you could be on that same shitty street, could be indistinguishable from any other big city. You could just know that you're in a big city, you know. So what makes New York New York 
if all it has is the same things that Chicago has and Philadelphia has and, you know, Los Angeles has. I mean, so that was always really goofy to me. So I think it's unique that this area has maintained that. And not just maintained it. I mean, some of these businesses are really thriving. Others aren't, but some are. Um, and that's pretty huge, especially when you see, you know, what's going on in the economy. And, you know, you've had big chains like Borders or Barnes & Nobles that are, you know, down the tubes. And so that's important, I think. I think people people identify with that. And even if it's just for nostalgia's sake, you know, I know for us, we do pretty well. We're lucky and the recession hasn't hurt us or anything. But Christmas is always our Christmas Eve, in, any, in the liquor industry especially, is the biggest day of the year. For us, it's always extra big, and we get so many people who have moved away or don't live in this area anymore, or they're visiting family from out of town, and they always make a point to, I'm going to stop on Christmas Eve to get you know, my wine or my whatever for Christmas Eve at Pico's. And that's a really big deal, um, and it means a lot to us, but it also, I think, that, that shows you that nostalgia factor and how important it is for businesses, and especially independent businesses. That person might have been a kid. And his dad lived in the neighborhood, and he every Christmas Eve they came here to buy, you know, the wine and the beer for a Christmas party or Christmas dinner, and that's something that he identifies with and he feels very strongly about and has nostalgia for. So he's going to do the same thing, and we see a lot of that. And I think that's probably true if you ask a lot of local businesses. They might not see those people every day, and it might just be easier. We're realists. We know that people aren't going to just come here because you know, like God knows my prices aren't the cheapest. You know, I don't have the biggest store, so I don't have the most products. You know. So they're not gonna, maybe they're not going to come here every day, and I understand that. And God knows I go to freaking Walmart sometimes, you know. Um, I try not to, but, you know, it's, sometimes it's just it's convenient, you know. In and out, you know they're going to have it, you know it's going to be cheap. But I think it means a lot to say that they feel strongly enough about it to say, you know what, today I'm not going to go to Total Wine. I'm going to go, and I'm going to pay the extra buck, or I'm going to, you know, ask Ed what kind of wine he recommends, because he might not have the one that I'm exactly looking for. But I'm going to feel good because I went there, you know. And I think that that is what this whole, and I think that area, this area has that going on for it, which is nice. I think after like almost 80 years in business, people know that Pico's is family owned and operated. So I've almost stopped saying it, to be honest. Um, but people can identify with it the minute they walk in. I mean, it's a different experience. Um, you know, I have customers who have shopped here forever and they can't believe that I'm 24 and working here now. You know, they remember when you were this big, you know. So I think that that, that on its own, it speaks volumes. And just, you know, you can tell when you're in a locally owned, independent, family run business as opposed to a, you know, mega super box store or even, you know, a small franchise. You know, I mean, everything has to be just so in a, in a mega franchise. You know, it has to be, this has to be here, this has to be here, the price has to be listed here, and boop, 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 and the employees have to look like this, they have to wear that. And it's just, you know, it's more relaxed. In the end, my bosses, my grandparents, and my mom, you know, which is a lot easier to deal with than, you know, some CEO who makes $18 billion a year and, you know, cares about what the shareholders say. I mean, we don't have our own boss. So if I don't want to put something up or don't want to do something a certain way, I don't have to do it, <laughs> which, which is nice. And uh, I think people appreciate the fact that I'm going to do it my way. And, you know, the store has to have a personality. It has to be different than going to one of those box stores. So, you know, we've always had a manager at the store, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, and now me. And so I think each time you have your personality in the store. So, for example, you know, my grandfather was in Korea and was fighting with some French guys, and he hates French people. He's never going to go to France, hates France, doesn't like it. Never carried a French wine, you know, well, which is in the wine industry, you kind of like, how the hell do you own a liquor store and not carry French wine? The only time you do it is someone browbeat him into like, come on, Frank, you got to buy this. It's really good. Um, so when I got here, I love French wines, one of my favorite styles, so I built this big French wine section, which was, you know, funny, and, you know, my grandfather was like, who are you selling a French wine for? Uh, but I think, you know, the same thing is, you know, some products, like, say, a white Zinfandel or a Moscato, okay? Moscato is a sweet white wine that's really, really popular right now. Uh, there's a hundred million different Moscatos out there right now. There's no way I'm going to carry all of them. I can't, you know? So I try and find the five best selling ones and put it in and that's it. So but then you get people who come and say, oh, well, do you have this brand of Moscato? No, I have this, 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 and this. Well, I don't like this. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and I don't have to really feel too bad about it because I know from our business end of things, if I'm just going to be a Moscato store, I might as well close up shop now. <laughs> but there's no ramification for that other than maybe a customer being disappointed, which ultimately, you know, I hate to see. But at the end, you have to do what's best for your business and the rest of the other customers that are here. And sometimes people feel that, you know, they know best or whatever. Um, but it's not something I have to, if I choose to ignore a trend, I do it at my own peril, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and 
yeah, for the most part, that works out pretty good. We don't have to worry about that, you know, kind of, you need to do this this way for this reason. It's like, no, I don't think Moscato is a good wine, so I'm not going to really promote it, you know. So that's nice that we have the ability to just do that and not have to have someone, you know, three tiers above me saying, nope, you got to do that. I, it's funny because I am a very competitive person and a very ambitious person, and I want everything to be 100% the way I want it today and it's hard when there's a lot I mean we have a state that has a lot of great liquor retailers and um, so it's hard to for me to be content with you know where we are right now because I know we can do better and I know we can do better so I always you know I'll have a really great you know we did like, use the growler legislation you know I was excited we got this legislation passed and we're, we're filling beer growlers and soon everybody in the state's gonna be doing it we had a big part of that and it makes me feel really happy but one of our big competitors you know got this fancy new system, you know, top of the line, hugely expensive, you know, and it makes you feel like, ah, come on, you know, after all that work, you know, look what happened. Um, but, you know, it's still, you can't take away the fact that we had a lot to do with the legislation and, and you know, that's, you know, we are who we are and that's why it's funny that I have to like remind myself why I love this business in the first place, you know. And the reason is because it's a small business and that, you know, I love the way, I love customer interaction and really good customers who come back all the time. And I was really having this bad, I was kind of having a bad day because this competitor of ours put had, had their grand opening and I kind of was like, great, you know. I outdid again, you know, always second best, you know. And But I had this customer come in who was, he had to be 100, you know, and uh, he was wearing a World War Two, you know, vet's hat. He was a paratrooper in World War Two. Dropped into Normandy, and when he left, he was 17. And I guess in when he left, it was 1941 or 42. So the store was only a couple years old then. Uh, but he lived in the neighborhood, and he wanted to buy a six pack of beer from my great grandfather. And my great grandfather wouldn't sell it to him because he wasn't 18 yet. He's like, "Oh, Mr. Pico, I'm going, I'm going away tomorrow. Who knows when I'll be back?" And my grandfather said, "Well, when you come back, I'll give you a case for free." So he went to war. He was in Normandy. He was in Germany. And yeah, he got home. His parents picked him up at the Wilmington train station. They came up Philly Pike and they returned down Marion Avenue to go to their house. And he remembers, oh shit, I guess I got to stop at Picos. So he stopped. And my grandfather remembered him. Great grandfather remembered him. Gave him a case of beer and yeah, sent him home. So here, here we are. You know, what, 60, 65 years later or something like that. And so the guy came in the store. He was visiting his nephew. He drove himself and he had a cane. It was a little wobbly, but he was pretty good. And he didn't come to buy anything, you know, he just came to talk and he wanted to tell me that story. And he's like, I guess it's still not family run. I was like, oh no, I was like, oh, that was my great grandfather you talked to. So uh, he got a big kick out of that. And, you know, we talked a lot about the neighborhood. He lived here and then he just he moved to Florida when he retired. He was like 60. And uh, he's, his wife had passed away 10 years ago, but he's still down there. And he comes up once a year to stay with his nephew. And they live in the area. So that was neat. And, you know, when I told him that he, he bought beer from my great grandfather. I was like, well, I gotta buy a beer from you now too. So he bought a beer and that was, I mean, that was really neat. And that, it was, I was having this really kind of bad day and that really helped me be like, oh, see, now this is, it's not all about comp competition and making everything perfect and being the best liquor store around, you know, right now. I mean, I think with passion and with, you know, people surrounding you with passion, you, ultimately we're gonna get to where I wanna be, you know, uh, and if that doesn't happen today, that's fine. But. It'll happen eventually, and then that customer really helped me be like, oh, okay. And I felt really better about what happened, you know. Because uh, I, I, when I when I was a kid, and when I was in high school and college even, I, I didn't want to come to the store to be, you know, Mr. Shrewd businessman, I'm going to make all this money and do all this stuff. I came here because I just genuinely love the atmosphere the store has. And, you know, the smell when I walk in the front door always reminds me of being a kid. And it's funny because like you don't appreciate that anymore, and we have an old heating system in here, so at, like at Christmas time the store has well winter time, but for me it was always Christmas time because I was always in school and I'd come back for Christmas break, so it has this like smell. So when the heat kicks on, it reminds me of the holidays, and I look forward to that all year. Christmas time in here is like, yeah, I could be here, you know, twelve hours and it wouldn't bother me because it's you know it's a good good day to to be doing business and to seeing a lot of great customers and all that. Uh, we do a lot of, we donate a lot of product to, you know, nonprofit organizations in the state. And, um, which is one of the things when I was in college, I was an intern for Philadelphia Distilling Company, and I did a lot of their sales events. And that was something they did a lot, which, you know, people would ask, hey, we need, you know, we're having a party for, you know, a fundraiser for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Could you donate some product? And, you know, it, it's inexpensive advertising, one, because you get to actually meet people and talk to people and 
pour your product. Um, but more importantly, it's helping you know these community businesses or community organizations that rely on those donations. Um, you know, if they're selling tickets for fifty dollars and they have to buy a lot of alcohol to supply these people, you're not going to make any money. So in the end, they need to get it donated. And so that was like a nice thing that we started doing that that a lot of our competition had done for a long time. But you know, before I got here, my grandfather was still the general manager, and he was you know, 80, he's not going to go out and pour wine for four hours at an event and be on his feet. So it's good to be able to get back into that crowd. And that kind of defines you as this like, you know, elite style, you know, customer service store or organization. And the stores that were doing tastings for nonprofits are the stores that have really good reputations. So it was a good thing for us to start doing. And, and I really found that I enjoyed it. And I, aside from loving doing what I do, I love marketing and I love branding and advertising. And, um, I like to do it for different things. It's easy to, you know, market my business because I know it so well. But it's a challenge to market someone else's nonprofit or someone else's business. And so it was always, you know, for me, it was enjoyable to work with these nonprofit groups and help them, you know, discover new ways to reach new customers or brand to new people or whatever. Um, so we did a lot of that with Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Aside from donating product, I worked with them on their. Uh, on their branding and, and some of other charity events and ran for one of their big fundraiser events and raised $17,000 in 10 weeks for that campaign, which was neat. And I enjoy that and it makes you feel like, hey, you're giving something back and, you know, everybody likes that. The, the Belfine area got hit kind of hard by the recession. A lot of businesses that had been around for a long time had closed. Um, we have a lot of, whereas before all the property owners lived in the area, so they moved away. Um, so, you know, anybody who doesn't live in an area tends to care less about it out of sight, out of mind. So, whereas before you had people who were really selective about who they rented their property to or how their property was maintained, um, we've seen a little decline in that. So, it was basically a group of business owners got together and said, well, let's, this is a really historic area and a really, really unique area. How do we attract new businesses and thus attract new customers, you know? Uh, so, we're in the very beginning stages of that. We, we had a meeting two weeks ago. We have another meeting in September. Um, but we have, I've been working with a, two of the younger guys and, and teaming up on doing like, you know, what we think the area would, would benefit from. So we'll see what comes of it. I mean, I'm, I'm very, you know, optimistic because we have a very strong residential community in Belfont and in Penny Hill and Lindemere and, you know, Gordon Heights. And it's not necessarily a cheap area. I mean, there's some medium household inco incomes in like the 300s and $400,000 range. So with that, you know, why aren't people shopping on the Philadelphia Pike? You know, why are they going elsewhere? So part of it is because there's nowhere to shop, you know. There's not really any service industries left. There's a lot of, you know, lawyers' offices and dentist's offices and tax professionals and accountants and realtors and this and that, which are all great businesses, but as far as bringing people in, that doesn't increase your foot traffic substantially. So um, the plan is a dining and shopping kind of day of leisure brand to, to Penny Hill and rebranding this area as, you know, Belfont slash Penny Hill. Um, Penny Hill used to be, there used to be a drawbridge, or not a drawbridge, but a toll booth uh, on Penny Hill. And the house is still there with the toll booth in it. And it was a penny if you were coming out of the city of Wilmington because Philadelphia Pike was the main thoroughfare between Baltimore, D.C. and Philadelphia, New York. There was no 95, so you had to take Route 13 all the way up. And so this was a very busy, historic stretch of road. Uh, two summers ago, they, they tore up all the roads out on Philadelphia Pike, and there was cobblestone under it, you know, and so it was original. And we were all like, well, can't we, you know, keep that? That's awesome. Well, they paved over it again. So it's, you know, it's interesting. This area has a lot of history, and, and it's a very, you know, scenic area. So let's make that, you know, attractive to other businesses and customers. I really am an advocate of people going away for school. I think it really helps you grow and discover who you are. I changed a lot in college. Not not like drastic, you know, oh, I don't, you know, I don't like this, I don't like that anymore, but just discovering a lot about who I was and, you know, what I like to do. And I think you can only do that on your own, you know, and, and not being with mom and dad and, you know, discovering, you know. For me, I never really, you know, I was, I was an RA and I really liked that. And my thing was I just like working with people and like, you know, and, and I think another thing was like learning that I have leadership skills, which I, you know, didn't really know before, but uh, you know, doing a lot of group projects or being a head RA or anything like that really helped me, you know, discover that and discover that like my style of leadership or my style of personality is just to be kind and to be good and 
hope that, you know, that will, you know, inspire people to do the same. And so that was, you know, I think that was important. And plus I met some great friends up there and, and it was only a 45 minute drive to get home. So I'd come home pretty frequently. I'd say, you know, one weekend a month at least. And at the time I was really starting to prep to work here. So I was working in the store a lot and I built our website for my dorm room and, you know, but I came home a lot to work in it, just generally because I like coming home. You know, I always take the train because I didn't have my car up there, and it's only like a 40-minute train ride. But it was a nice train ride. I always would get really excited, you know, to be coming home. And you know, even if I'd only been there the week before, it was always like a nice treat to go home. And uh, you know, same with going to see Jackie in New York. Um, if you go to the train station, you know, you're going through the tunnel. You know, you're gonna, you know, when you start going through the tunnel, when you get done, you're gonna be in New York City, which is really exciting. And yeah, so I enjoyed it. I mean, I love Philly. I love St. Joe's. It was a really pretty campus and great people, and you know, I learned a lot. And it's a good program. So I, I, I kind of miss it. It was funny because at the time I was more looking forward to post grad and you know getting on with things, especially with the store. And now I just kind of like him. Oh man, it'd be nice to like sit around on a Tuesday and just do nothing. You know, uh, <laughs> I remember like just when we were seniors, my friends had a house and just sitting on their front porch and just doing you know, just nothing sitting around bullshitting, you know, it was, you can't never do that again, you know, you'll never be able to, I mean, you have, oh, I had three classes today, be in class till two in the afternoon, are you kidding me, you know, it's like, <laughs> awesome, <Yeah. laughs> and then just do nothing for the rest of the afternoon. Being an RA was a lot of fun, I, I enjoyed that, and I really did it out of kind of necessity, because St. Joe's was kind of pricey, and I was like, oh, this way I can get free room, and board, and everything, and I thought I'd work with a bunch of hard ass, you know. You know, ball breakers, but they were all pretty cool, and a lot of them were doing it for the exact same reason I was doing it. So we had a good time, and some of my best friends today are, you know, guys I was an RA with, and you know, I always told the guys on my floor, I was like, look, if I have to write you up, you are doing something seriously, seriously fucked up. <laughs> like seriously, like bring it in, man. <laughs> I mean, I had one guy uh, who liked to smoke the reefer all the time, and I would be like, oh, man, it kind of smells out here. But, oh, yeah, I don't know what's up with that. And the smoke would be billowing out of his door. But I actually have to write him up eventually, but what are you going to do? Summer camp was cool. I, I really enjoyed, I've always enjoyed working with kids. I like kids. I'm a, I'm a kid person. Uh, so that was kind of like an ideal summer job for me. Met some of my best friends working there. Um, it was like the perfect job for a high school kid because, you know, you have to be at work at 8.30, which is later than I had to be at school, you know, and I was done by four. And I think that personality of patient, you have to be patient, you have to be a big kid, really, is, is what it comes down to. And you have to be fun and kind to work with kids and to enjoy it. Um, so I think with a camp like that, all those people who work there have the same personality traits. So you all are ready-made friends, really. I mean, it's like... You're like, you have the same personality, so everybody meshes together really well. And you know, even though some of them I've only worked with for a year, because then I left to you know, do an internship and stuff like that, I'm still really good friends with and you know, enjoy just hanging out with them. I mean, they're just usually easygoing people. So, I mean, that, that was the same type of thing is, is, you know, learning that most people are good uh, and then sometimes people are not good, <laughs> you know, like we had, yeah, and you can always like figure out those people who just aren't kid people and it's like, why are you working at a summer camp, you know, um, but I think it goes to show you there's all sorts of different people and you need all sorts of different people to make this world work and so while, you know, I'm great, grateful to hang out with all those guys and had a good time at camp, there's also, you know, people I met who didn't necessarily jive well with the camp thing, but they're still, you know, good friends and stuff. And then, like, you know, it's, it's funny also, like, watching those kids grow up. I had one group pretty much the entire time I was there. And now those kids are, like, in high school, like, getting ready to graduate. I was like, holy crap, no freaking way. Like, that's insane to me. So, I mean, it's, it makes you feel old, for sure, but in a good way. Sometimes, you know, I meet, you know, networking events. I always, like, I always tell people, well, what do you do? I don't know, liquor, man liquor retail manager. And, you know, you kind of get, like, a look, like, oh, really, you know? Um, but for me, I mean, it, it, in a way, like, liquor in all forms is, well, in most forms, not all forms, is, is a form of art. You know, I mean, a lot of times with wine, it's somebody spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of, you know, talent trying to make this wine the way they want it. You know, just like an artist would make, take a lot of time, money, and, you know, talent to make a work of art look just the way they want it. Uh, it's not the case with everything, you know. And with any industry, and, you know, especially ours, there's definitely people who abuse it, uh, which is, you know, tough to see. Uh, I think every liquor store owner can relate to having, you know, there are a few customers who are regulars who probably shouldn't be regulars. Um, but, you know, that happens, and 
it, it's a shame, but when, when used the right way, alcohol and wine and spirits and beer can be this really great, you know, addition to life. And, um, some people thoroughly enjoy it and some people like to study it and examine it and that's fine too. It's just, I always say the same thing. It's whatever you make of it is, is how you're supposed to, you know, relate to it. Um, I wouldn't say I, I've taken a lot of classes on wine and I feel I know a lot about wine. I wouldn't call myself an expert. But for me, I never am one of those people who has to, you know, bury my nose in a glass of wine for 15 minutes before I drink it to try and figure out the subtle flavors of boysenberry and black currant and, you know, I just don't enjoy it that way. I mean, for me, I like to appreciate, like, well, this is good wine and it goes really good with this burger I'm having or it goes really good with this pizza or this steak or whatever. Um, but it's different for everybody. Uh, I always tell people if, you know, one of our retail friends is adamantly against the white Zinfandel and I always tell people, well... You know, if that's what you like, who cares? You know, drink it. There's people who come in here and, you know, oh, I'm having steak, and the wine magazine says I need to have a Cabernet, but I hate Cabernet. Well, if you hate Cabernet, why would you drink it? You know, like, drink what you like, because in the end, that's what's going to pair the best with your meal, because you like it. <laughs> My fiance loves Moscato. I don't like it that much. I still sell up to 10 brands of it, and, you know, People ask for it all the time, and we sell a lot of it, and she loves it, but it's not for me. It doesn't mean I'm not going to sell it or not going to enjoy it, but enjoy selling it, or <laughs> make me happy that people are, you know, enjoying it themselves. So, you know, I think that that's important, and, um, you know, trends come and go. Right now, we're in this craft beer thing, and that's really neat because you have all these guys who have been home brewers for whoever knows how long, and now they have these breweries that have grown to international success, um, or some of them who are just doing all right. And that's cool too. We met one guy uh, in Maryland, Rock Hall, Maryland, I think. Baying Hound Brewery, Paul Reinhardt. And he was a head executive chef and he just said to work in the restaurant industry you had to be an asshole and he didn't want to be an asshole anymore. So he literally opened a brewery, a storage locker, basically. And uh, he does pretty good and he's, you know, I asked him how you doing business wise. He said, well, my wife wouldn't let me come hang out in the storage locker and bank beer all day if I wasn't making any money. So, you know, that's great. Uh, not everybody's going to be like a dogfish head or a New Belgian or Sam Adams, you know, uh, some guys are going to just be in the middle and that's good for them because they're still in the end, you're doing what you love to do and, you know, making this product that is awesome and the people enjoy and, and that craft beer really epitomizes that whole artwork thing. I mean, these guys have spent years, literally years making these beers the way they want them to be and, you know, getting them to the marketplace. And so it's interesting to see. And there's products like Four Loco that, you know, just was a brainchild of a bunch of like, how can we get some underage kids super drunk and have them stay awake longer so they can drink more? And you know, that didn't last very long. We never sold it either, but you know, it's you know, it's it's one of those things. The way I choose to look at it is literally like, I, you know, I mean, I think it's important. I don't think it's taboo. I don't think it's dirty. And I've really gotten over the fact of telling people that I, I work in a liquor store. Um, I don't really care. You know, for me, it's it's the best thing ever. And you know, you're hard pressed to find people who don't enjoy liquor. You know. <laughs> There's this thing called prohibition. I don't know if you might have heard of it, but it didn't go over too well. So uh, I think that that kind of aspect of it, where yeah, you know, there is people who do abuse abuse alcohol. And obviously, there's people who abuse all sorts of things. But that that always is is the tough thing to overcome. And yeah, I had one guy once who was uh, like a radical kind of evangelicalist preacher telling me that I was peddling you know sin water and that I should be ashamed of myself. And I was like, really? I think you could use a drink, pal. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, whatever. I'm proud of what I do. And and I, I like the to have the flexibility to do other things, you know, like uh, like doing the volunteer work and doing, you know, um, yeah, philanthropy or working with the local business association to do, you know, this revitalization project and, and all that stuff. I, I get a big kick out of that, and I enjoy doing it. So I like to have the flexibility to do that. Uh, I'm excited. You know, I mean, it looks good. We're doing the renovation at the store starting in the next couple of weeks, so we'll add some square footage there, which is good. Uh, personal life wise, I'm ecstatic. You know, I'm getting married in under a year now, and you know, we have a house that we're working on and stuff. Um, looking forward to having kids eventually. Not right away. We're still young. You know, um, I want to travel. I want to, you know, have some carefree, like you know, get as close to college years as I can. You know, before <laughs> before I have kids, but I can't wait to have kids. I mean, I. Jackie can't either. We're both kid people, and yeah, you know, we're lucky because Jackie's brothers have like some of the cutest, most fun kids ever, and yeah, we get to spend a lot of time with them, which is great. And you know, in the end, we get to turn them back over to their parents. So it's like the best of both worlds. You know, it's 
they get to I get to hang out with you know Matt and Johnny and Lauren and Autumn and then it's when it's time to go to bed and everybody starts getting a little grumpy and a little tired. It's like all right guys, well time to go home. We'll, we'll see you we'll see you next time. We'll pump you full of sugar and bring you to the movie. So uh, <laughs> so that's nice. I get to like you know really see that and 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 stuff. And it makes me kind of like oh man, I can't wait to have kids. And you know at the same time it's also like oh, yeah, I can wait a couple of years. You know? But. Uh, <laughs> It'll be good. I, I'm excited. And, you know, I'm lucky that I get to work with my family regularly. I mean, it's not always the easiest thing in the world. And I think mostly that's because I see them as an extension of myself, you know. And, and for me, it's always, I get more upset with myself than I do with other people. I want our store to be perfect all the time. And when something gets messed up, it's not like talking to a normal boss or superior. Cause I'm like, what do you mean you didn't do that? We're trying to run a business here. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, you know, I wouldn't change it. For anything obviously but I, I I'd like to <laughs> to be a little more patient for sure because I'm not the best at that my grandfather and me are a lot alike and you know it's just because I was literally by his side out in the store as a kid my whole life and you know, I just love the way he is and, and and the person he is and you know one thing is he's, he's got way more patience than me and he's a little nicer than me because for me I'll always be nice to you until you do something to me that is not so nice and then I've had zero patience for you I don't know how he does it, and I talk to him all the time, but he's really good at turning the other cheek and, you know, being nice to everybody no matter what the circumstances are, which is kind of something I hope to uh, to grow to emulate over the years. Because for me, I take things very personally, and it's kind of, you know, oh, you screw me? Okay, well, you know, that's the end of you. I'll, I'll be the nicest person in the world to you, you know, until you do something to, to hurt me. And and he's always like, I don't know how he does it, because I think that's a really difficult thing for anybody to do, but he's, he's really good at that. And, uh, he, yeah, him, my grandmother, just, they're two of the kindest people that I've ever met in my life. And, you know, they'll do anything for anybody, which is how I feel. You know, I think if the whole world was like that, it would be a really great place. Um, and I always feel that way. I'll go the extra mile for you um, and, and, and do anything I can to, to help you. Um, and it's not always easy, but, you know, I think it's important. And in the end, you hope that somebody else will do the same for you. And that's not always the case. And that's the hard part is realizing that, you know, it's, you, you got to be able to say, yeah, you know, they might not do the same for me, but I, I want to do the same for them, not just for them, but, you know, for yourself, because it makes you feel better. Um, and my mom, when I was younger, I had a lot of, I had a lot of, you know, difficulties, learning disabilities, this, that, and the other thing. And she was always, you know, pushing me to do everything. That's why I always tell people it's hard for me to accept not being number one because she always told me like, you can be the best, you know, you just got to work at it. And so I think for me, that's where my competitive, you know, this, I can't lose attitude comes from. And that's why I take things so personally when I don't finish first. And, um, you know, I thank her for that because I think it's really important and it really made me who I am. I don't think she quite meant it to be as extreme as it's gotten, but, uh, <laughs> She always, she always, she always says to me like, yeah, sometimes not so positively, but sometimes positively is like that she created this monster of like, you know, she's like, you just, you know, you just think that you're the best. I'm like, I am the best. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, um, I don't really think that, but I think it's important to be really confident. And even if you're not a hundred percent confident in what you're doing, you have to let everybody else know that you are, especially, you know, competition or employees or whatever, like. You know, they need to know that, you know, what I'm doing is the right thing for our business and, you know, our community. And I think if you do that, you get a lot of people on board. And that's another another way to lead is to say, you know, like, nope, this is the right course of action. This is how we're doing it. And even if in the back of my head, I'm like, well, we'll see how this works out, you know. I think if everybody else can get behind you and say, well, hey, Ed thinks it's a good idea, you know, it's a good idea. We're going to do it. And and that's all that's all just from her, you know, from being a kid and, you know, growing up with, you know, a couple couple of difficulties and, and getting over it and you know being able to exceed and you know I mean when I was in second grade they told me I could never I never be able to read you know so I graduated from one of the best Catholic schools in the country you know did pretty good so uh, yeah worked no, out I'd say so I'd say so <laughs> yeah